All right, so you should have answered your questions by now for chapter three. So we are going to move into chapter four of The Green Mile, The Two Dead Girls. King Cotton had been disposed in the South 70 years before all these things happened and would never be king again. But in those years of the 30s, it had a little revival. There were no more cotton plantations, but there were 40 or 50 prosperous cotton farms in the southern part of our state. Claus Diederich owned one of them. By the standards of the 1950s, he would have been considered only a rung above shirt tail poor. But by those of the 30s, he was considered well-to-do because he actually paid his store bill in cash at the end of most months. And he could meet the bank president's eyes if they happened to pass on the street. The farmhouse was clean and commodious. In addition to the cotton, there were the other two C's, chickens and a few cows. He and his wife had three children, Howard, who was 12 or thereabouts, and the twin girls, Cora and Kathy. On a warm night in June of that year, the girls asked for it and were given permission to sleep on the screen enclosed side porch, which ran the length of the house. This was a great treat for them. Their mother kissed them goodnight, just shy of nine, when the last light had gone out of the sky. It was the final time she saw either of them until they were in their coffins and the undertaker had repaired the worst of the damage. Country families went to bed early in those days, soon as twas dark under the table. My own mother sometimes said and slept soundly. Certainly, Claus, Marjorie, and Howie Diederich did on the night the twins were taken. Claus would almost certainly have been wakened by Bowser, the family's big old half-breed collie. If he had barked, but Bowser didn't, not that night, not ever again. Claus was up at first light to do the milking. The porch was on the side of the house, away from the barn, and Claus never thought to look in on the girls. Bowser's failure to join him was no cause for alarm either. The dog held the cows and the chickens alike in great disdain, and usually hid in his doghouse behind the barn when the chores were being performed, unless called, and called energetically at that. Marjorie came downstairs 15 minutes or so after her husband had pulled on his boots in the mudroom and trumped out to the barn. She started the coffee, then put bacon on to fry. The combined smells brought Howie down from his room under the eaves, but not the girls from the porch. She sent Howie out to fetch them as she cracked eggs into the bacon grease. Claus would want the girls out to get fresh ones as soon as breakfast was over, except no breakfast was eaten in the Diederich house that morning. Howie came back from the porch, white around the gills, and with his formerly sleek, puffy eyes now wide open. They're gone, he said. Marjorie went out onto the porch, at first more annoyed than alarmed. She said later that she had supposed, if she had supposed anything, that the girls had decided to take a walk and pick flowers by the dawn's early light. That or some similar green girl foolishness. One look and she understood why Howie had been white. She screamed for Claus, shrieked for him, and Claus came on the dead run his workbooks whitened by the half-full pail of milk he had spilled on them. What he found on the porch would have jellied the legs of the most courageous parent. The blankets in which the girls would have bundled themselves as the night drew on and grew colder had been cast into one corner. The screen door had been yanked off his upper hinge and hung drunkenly out into the dooryard. And on the boards of both the porch, in the steps beyond the mutilated screen door, there were spatters of blood. Marjorie begged her husband not to go hunting after the girls alone and not to take their son if he felt he had to go after them. But she could have saved her breath. He took the shotgun he kept mounted in the mudroom high out of the reach of little hands and gave Howie the 22 they had been saving for his birthday in July. Then they went neither of them paying attention, the slightest attention, to the shrieking, weep, weeping woman who wanted to know what they would do if they met a gang of wandering hobos 
or a bunch of bad niggers escape from the county farm over in Leduc. In this, I think the men were right, you know? The blood was no longer running, but it was only tacky yet, and still closer to true red than the maroon that comes when blood has well dried. The abduction hadn't happened too long ago. Claus must have reasoned that there was still a chance for his girls, and he meant to take it. Neither of them could track worth a damn. They were gatherers, not hunters, men who went into the woods after coon and deer in their seasons, not because they much wanted to, but because it was an expected thing. In the dooryard around the house was a blighted patch of dirt with tracks all overlaid in a meaningless tangle. They went around the barn and saw almost at once why Bowser, a bad biter but a good barker, hadn't sounded the alarm. He lay half in and half out of a doghouse, which had been built of leftover barn boards. There was a signboard with the word Bowser neatly printed on it over the curved hole in the front. I saw a photograph of it in one of the papers. His head turned most of the way around on his neck. It would have taken a man of enormous power to have done that to such a big animal. The prosecutor later told John Coffey's jury, and then he had looked long and meaningfully at the hawking de defendant sitting behind the defense table with his eyes cast down and wearing a brand new pair of state bought bib overalls that looked like damnation in and of themselves. Beside the dog, Claus and Howie found a scrap of cooked link sausage. The theory, a sound one, I have no doubt, was that Coffee had first charmed the dog with treats, and then, as Bowser began to eat the last one, had reached out his hands and broken his neck with one mighty snap of his wrist. Beyond the barn was Dietrich's, Dietrich's north pasture, where no cows were grazed that day. It was drenched with morning dew and leading off through it, cutting on a diagonal to the northwest and plain as day was the beaten track of a man's passage. Even in his state of near hysteria, Claus Dietrich hesitated at first to follow it. It wasn't fear of the man or men who had taken his daughters. It was fear of following the abductor's back trail, of going off in exactly the wrong direction at a time when every second might count. How he saw that dilemma by plucking a shred of yellow cotton cloth from a bush growing just beyond the edge of the doorway. Claus was shown the same scrap of cloth as he sat on the witness stand and began to weep as he identified it as a piece of his daughter's Kathy sleeping shorts. 20 yards beyond it, hanging from the jutting finger of a juniper shrub, they found a piece of faded green cloth that matched the nighty Cora had been wearing when she kissed her ma and pa goodnight. The Dieterich's father and son set off at a near run with their guns held in front of them as soldiers do when crossing contested ground under heavy fire. If I wonder at anything that happened that day, it is that the boy chasing desperately after his father and often in danger of being left behind completely never fell and put a bullet in Claus Dieterich's back. The farmhouse was on the exchange, another sign to the neighbors that the Dieterichs were prospering, at least moderately, in disastrous times. And Marjorie used Central to call as many of her neighbors that were also on the exchange as she could, telling them of the disaster which had fallen like a lightning stroke, stroke out of a clear sky, knowing that each call would produce overlapping ripples like pebbles tossed rapidly into a stilly pond. Then she lifted the handset one last time and spoke those words that were almost a trademark of the early telephone systems of that time, at least in the rural South. Hello, Central, are you on the line? Central was, but for a moment, could say nothing. That worthy woman was all agog. At last she managed. Yes, ma'am, Mrs. Dieterich, I sure am, oh dear, sweet blessed Jesus. I'm a praying right now that your little girls are all right. Yes, thank you, Marjorie said. But you tell the Lord to wait long enough for you to put me through to the high sheriff's office down Tefton, all right? 
The Trampagus County High Sheriff was a whiskey-nosed old boy with a gut like a wash tub and a head of white hair so fine it looked like pipe cleaner fuzz. I knew him well. He'd been up to Cold Mountain plenty of times to see what he called his boys off into the great beyond. Execution witnesses sat in the same folding chairs you've probably sat in yourself a time or two at funerals or church suppers or Grange bingo. In fact, we borrowed ours from the Mystic Tie number 44 Grange back in those days. And every time Sheriff Homer Cribbis sat down in one, I waited for the dry crack that was signal collapse. I dreaded that day and hoped for it both at the same time. But it was a day that never came. Not long after, couldn't have been more than one summer after the Dieterich girls were abducted, he had a heart attack in his office, apparently while screwing a 17-year-old black girl named Daphne Shirtliff. There was a lot of talk about that, with him always sporting his wife and six boys around so prominent come election time. Those were the days when, if you wanted to run for something, the saying used to be, be Baptist or be gone. But people love a hypocrite, you know? They recognize one of their own, and it always feels so good when someone gets caught with his pants down and his dick up, and it wasn't you. Besides being a hypocrite, he was incompetent, the kind of fellow who get himself photographed petting some lady's cat when it was someone else. Deputy Rob McGee, for instance, who'd actually risked a broken collar by going up the tree where Mistress Pussycat was and bringing her down. McGee listened to Marjorie Dieterick babble for maybe two minutes, then cut her off with four or five questions, quick and curt, like a trained fighter's flickering little jabs to the face, the kind of punches that are so small and so hard that the blood comes before the sting. When he had answers to these, he said, I'll call Bobo Marchant. He's got dogs. You stay put, Miss Dieterick. If your man and your boy come back, make them stay put too. Try anyway. Her man and her boy had meanwhile followed the track of the abductor three miles to the northwest. But when his trail ran out of open fields and into piney woods, they lost it. They were farmers, not hunters, as I had said. And by then, they knew it was an animal they were after. Along the way, they had found the yellow top that matched Kathy's shorts in another piece of Corey's night tie. Nighty. Both items were drenched with blood and neither Kloss nor Howie was in as much of a hurry as they had been at the start. A certain cold certainty must have been filtering into their hot hopes by then, working its way downward the way cold water does, sinking because it is heavier. They cast into the woods, looking for signs, found none, cast in the second place with a similar lack of result, then in the third. This time, they found a fan tail of blood splashed across the needles of a loblolly pine. They went into the direction it seemed to point for a little way, then began the casting about process again. It was by then nine o'clock in the morning, and from behind them, they began to hear shouting men and baying dogs. Rob McGee had put together a Jack Lake posse in the time it would have taken Sheriff Cribbis to finish his first brandy sweetened cup of coffee. And by quarter past the hour, they reached Claus and Howie Dieterich, the two of them stumbling desperately around on the edge of the woods. Soon the men were moving again, with Bobo's dogs leading the way. McGee let Claus and Howie go on with them. They wouldn't have gone back if you ordered them, no matter how much they dreaded the outcome. And McGee must have seen that, but he made them unload their weapons. The others had done the same, McGee said. It was safer. What he didn't tell them, nor did anyone else, was that the Dieterichs were the only ones who had been asked to turn their loads over to the deputy. Half distracted and wanting only to go through to the end of the nightmare and be done with it, they did as he asked. When Rob McGee got the Dieterichs to unload their guns and give him their loads, he probably saved John Coffey's miserable excuse for a life. The baying, yelping dogs followed them through two miles of scrub pine, always on that same rough northwest heading. Then they came out on the edge of the trap against the river, which is wide and slow at that point. Running southeast through low wooded hills, where families named Cray and Robinette and Duplissy 
still made their own mandolins and often spat out their own rotted teeth as they plowed. Deep countryside where men were apt to handle snakes on Sunday morning and lie down in carnal embrace with their daughters on Sunday night. Ooh. I knew their families. Most of them had sent Sparky a meal from time to time. On the far side of the river, the members of the posse could see the June sun glinting off the steel rails of a great southern branch line. About a mile downstream to their right, a trestle crossed toward the coal fields of West Green. Here they found a wide trampled patch in the grass and low bushes, a patch so bloody that many of the men had to sprint back into the woods and relieve themselves of their breakfast. They also found the rest of Cora's nightgown lying in this bloody patch, and Howie, who had held up admirably, 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 until then, reeled back against his father and nearly fainted. And it was here that Bobo Merchant's dogs had their first and only disagreement of the day. There were six in all, two bloodhounds, two blue tick hounds, and a couple of those terry-like mongrels border southerners call coon hounds. The coonies wanted to go northwest, upstream, along the Trampagans. The rest wanted to go in the other direction, southeast. They got all tangled in their leads, and although the paper said nothing about this part, I could imagine the horrible curses Bobo must have rained down on them as he used his hands, surely, the most educated part of him, to get them straightened around again. I have, known, I have known a few hound dog men in my time, and it's been my experience that as a class, they run remarkably true to type. Bobo short leashed them into a pack, then ran Cora Diederich's torn nightgown under their noses to kind of remind them what they were doing out on a day when the temperature would be in the mid 90s by noon, and the nauseums would already Circling, were already circling the heads of the postmen and clouds. The Coonies took another sniff, decided to vote the straight ticket, and off they all went downstream in full cry. It wasn't but ten minutes later when the men stopped, realizing they could hear more than just the dogs. It was a howling rather than a bang, and a sound no dog had ever made, not even in its dying extremities. It was a sound none of them had ever heard anything make, but they knew right away, all of them, that it was a man. So they said, and I believe them, I think I would have recognized it too. I have heard men scream just that way. I think on their way to the electric chair, not a lot. Most button themselves up and go either quiet or joking, like it was the class picnic, but a few. Usually the ones who believe in hell as a real place, and know it is waiting for them at the end of the green mile. Bobo short-leashed his dogs again. They were valuable, and he had no intention of losing them to the psychopath howling and gibbering just down yonder. The other men reloaded their guns and snapped them close. Their howling had chilled them all and made the sweat under their arms and running down their backs feel like ice water. When men take a chill like that, they need a leader if they are to go on. And Deputy, M Deputy McGee led them. He got out in front and walked briskly. I bet he didn't feel very brisk right then, though. To a stand of alders that jutted out of the wood on the right, with the rest of them trundling along nervously about five paces behind. He paused just once, and that was to motion the biggest man among them. Sam Hollis, to keep near Claus Diederich. On the other side of the alders, there was more open ground stretching back to the woods on the right. On the left was a long, gentle slope of the riverbank. They all stopped where they were, thunderstruck. I think they would have given a good deal to unsee what was before them, and none of them would ever forget it. It was a sort of nightmare, bald and almost smoking in the sun, that lies beyond the drapes and furnishings of good and ordinary lives. Church suppers, walks along the country lanes, honest work, love kisses in bed. There is a skull in every man, and I tell you, there is a skull in the lives of all men. They saw it that day. Those men, they saw was sometimes grins behind the smile. Sitting on the riverbank in a faded blood-stained jumper, 
was the biggest man any of them had ever seen, John Coffey. His enormous splay-toed feet were bare. On his head, he wore a faded red bandana, the way a country woman would wear a kerchief into church. Nat circled him in a black cloud. Curled in each arm was the body of a naked girl. Their blonde hair, once curly and light as milkweed fluff, was now matted to their heads and streaked red. The man holding them sat bawling up at the sky like a moonstruck calf. His dark brown cheeks slicked with tears, his face twisted in a monstrous cramp of grief. He drew breath in hitches, his chest rising until the snaps holding the straps of his jumper were strained, and then let that vast catch of air out in another of those howls. So often you read in the paper that the killer showed no remorse, but that wasn't the case here. John Coffey was torn open by what he had done, but he would live. The girls would not. They had been torn open in a more fundamental way. No one seemed to know how long they stood there, looking at the howling man who was, in his turn, looking across the great still plate of the river at a train on the other side, storming down the tracks toward the trestle that crossed the river. It seemed they looked for an hour or forever, and yet the train got no farther along. It seemed to storm only in one place, like a child doing a tantrum, and the sun did not go behind a cloud, and the sight was not blotted from their eyes. It was there before them, as real as a dog bite. The black man rocked back and forth. Cora and Kathy rocked with him like dolls in the arms of a giant. The bloodstained muscles in the man's huge bare arms flexed and relaxed, flexed and relaxed, flexed and relaxed. It was Claus Diederich who broke the tableau. Screaming, he flung himself at the monster who had raped and killed his daughters. Sam Hollis knew his job and tried to do it, but couldn't. He was six inches taller than Klaus and outweighed him by at least 70 pounds. But Klaus seemed to almost shrug at his encircling arms off. Klaus flew across the intervening open ground and launched a flying kick at Coffee's head. His workbook cake with spilled milk that had already soured in the heat scored a direct hit on Coffee's left temple. But Coffee seemed not to feel it at all. He only sat there, keening and rocking and looking out across the river. The way I imagined it, he could almost have been a picture out of some piney woods Pentecostal sermon. The faithful follower of the cross looking out toward Goshen land. If not for the corpses that was, it took four men to haul the historical farmer, hysterical farmer, off John Kofi, and he fetched Kofi. I didn't know how many good licks before they finally did. It didn't seem to matter to Kofi one way or the other. He just went on looking out across the river and keening. As for Diederich, all the fight went out of him when he was finally pulled off, as if some strange galvanizing current had been running through the huge black man. I still have a tendency to think in electrical metaphors. You'll have to pardon me. And when Diederich's contact with their power source was finally broken, he went as limp as a man flung back from a live wire. He knelt wide leg onto the riverbank with his hands to his face, sobbing. Howie joined him and they hugged each other forehead to forehead. Two men watched them while the rest formed a rifle-toting ring around the rocking, wailing black man. He still seemed not to realize that anyone but him was there. McGee stepped forward, shifted uncertainly from foot to foot for a bit, then hunkered. Mister, he said in a quiet voice, and Coffee hushed at once. McGee looked at eyes that were bloodshot from crying and still they streamed as if someone had left a faucet on inside him. Those eyes wept and yet were somehow untouched, distant and serene. I thought them the strangest eyes I had ever seen in my life, and McGee felt much the same. Like the eyes of an animal that never saw a man before, he told a reporter named Hammersmith just before the trial. Mister, do you hear me? McGee asked. Slowly, Slowly, Coffee nodded his head. Still, he curled his arms around his unspeakable dolls, their chins down on their chest, 
so their faces could not be clearly seen. One of the few mercies God saw fit to bestow that day. Do you have a name, McGee asked? John Coffey, he said, in a thick and tear clotted voice. Coffee, like the drink, only not spelled the same way. McGee nodded, then pointed a thumb at the chest pocket of Coffee's jumper, which was bulging. It looked to McGee like it might have been a gun, not that a man Coffee size would need a gun to do some major damage if he decided to go off. What's that in there, John Coffee? Is that maybe a heater, a pistol? No, sir, Coffee said in his thick voice, and those strange eyes welling tears and agonized on top, distant and weirdly serene underneath, as if the true John Coffee was somewhere else, looking out on some other landscape where murdered little girls were nothing to get all worked up about. Never left Deputy McGee's. That's just a little lunch I have. Oh, now, a little lunch, is that right? McGee asked, and Coffee nodded and said, yes, sir, with his eyes running and clear snot runners hanging out of his nose. And where did the likes of you get a little lunch, John Coffee? Forcing himself to be calm, although he could smell the girls by then and could see the flies lightning and sampling the places on them that were wet. It was their hair that was the worst, he said later, and this wasn't in any newspaper story. It was considered too grisly for family reading. Know this I got from the reporter who wrote the story, Mr. Hammersmith. I looked him up later on because later on John Coffey became sort of an obsession with me. McGee told this Hammersmith that their blonde hair wasn't blonde anymore. It was all burned. Blood had run down their cheeks out of it like it was a bad dye job. And you didn't have to be a doctor to see that their fragile skulls had been dashed together with the force of those mighty arms. Probably they had been crying. Probably he had wanted to make them stop. If those girls had been lucky, this had happened before the rapes. Looking at that made it hard for a man to think. Even a man as determined to do his job as Deputy McGee was. Bad thinking could cause mistakes, maybe more bloodshed. McGee drew him in a deep breath and calmed himself, tried anyway. Well, sir, I don't exactly remember. We dog if I do. Coffee said in his tear choked voice, but it's a little lunch, all right. Sandwiches and I think a sweet pickle. I might just have to look for myself. It's all the same to you, McGee said. Don't you move down now, John Coffee. Don't do it, boy, because there are enough gang guns aimed at you to make you disappear from the waist up, should you so much as twitch a finger. Coffee looked out across the river and didn't move as McGee gently pulled reached into the chest pocket of those Bibles and pulled out something wrapped in newspaper and tied with a hank of butcher's twine. McGee snapped the string and opened the paper, although he was pretty sure it was just what Coffee said it was, a little lunch. There was a bacon tomato sandwich and a jelly fold over. There was also a pickle wrapped in its own piece of a funny page John Coffee would never be able to puzzle out. There were no sausages. Bowser had gotten the sausages out of John Coffey's little lunch. McGee handed the lunch back over his shoulder to one of the other men without taking his eyes off Coffey. Hunkered down like that, he was too close to want to let his attention stray for even a second. The lunch wrapped up again and tied for good measure, finally ended up with Bobo Marchant, who put it in his knapsack, knapsack where he kept treats for his dogs and a few fishing lures, I shouldn't wonder. It wasn't introduced into evidence at the trial. Justice in this part of the world is swift, but not as swift as a bacon tomato sandwich goes over, though photographs of it were. What happened here, John Coffey? McGee asked in his low, earnest voice. You want to tell me that? And Coffey said to McGee and the others almost exactly the same thing he said to me. They were also the last words the prosecutor said to the jury at Coffey's trial. I couldn't help it, John Coffey said, holding the murdered, violated girls naked in his arms. The tears began to pour down his cheeks again. I tried to take it back, but it was too late. Boy, you are under arrest for murder, McKee said, and then he spit in John Coffey's face. The jury was out 45 minutes, just about time enough to eat a little lunch on their own. I wonder... 
they had any stomach for it. So this concludes chapter four of the Green Mile to Dead Girls. So make sure you answer your questions and be prepared for uh, chapter five and six tomorrow.